While assassinations may not be new, the degree to which they are utilized, most notably at a local level, is reminiscent of mafia-like violence. The use of targeted killings or the threat thereof to obtain political or economic gain. Mark Shaw and Kim Thomas. How do you quantify the damage a targeted assassination has on society? Of course, you have the violence of the act itself and the grief that follows for those closest to the victim. But an assassination is like a stone being dropped in the middle of a still pond. The splash is the violent act itself. The ripples are the repercussions that spread far and wide. Fear, intimidation, silencing, corruption, the erosion of trust, environmental damage, illicit firearms, impunity, and retaliation. After all, violence begets violence. The damage to society is far-reaching, way beyond the shock of that initial killing. The role of organized crime in this issue is complex. Whether it's protecting their turf or illicit supply lines or providing the hitmen for the corrupt networks that seek their deadly services. This is Deep Dive, exploring organized crime from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. I'm Jack Megan Vickers. And today we're discussing Killing in Silence, the Global Assassinations Monitor. Here at the GI, we've been working on the issue of assassinations for some time. Since 2015, we've been monitoring and collecting data on the crime in South Africa, where the taxi industry supplies a ready pool of contract killers. In 2020, we released a podcast series called Faces of Assassination, which featured stories of the 50 profiles selected for the book of the same name. Alongside this, we had discussions with leading experts in the topic of contract killings. We've covered journalists, land defenders, human rights defenders, politicians, gang mediators, assassination investigators, and so on. And what struck me was the scale of the problem. Contract killings are happening in every corner of the world, from Colombia and Canada to Ghana and Sweden, India and the Philippines. Everywhere. And they are on the rise. Marvellous. Right. So, Anna, if we can start with you, if you can introduce yourself and then your role at the GI, and then Nina, if you can follow. Sure. I'm Ana Paula Oliveira, and I'm an analyst at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. Hi, I'm Nina Kaiser, and I'm a senior analyst at the Global Initiative. Right. So you're comfortable, happy, ready to go? No. <laughs> <laughs> Anna Paula and Nina have been working on the Global Assassinations Monitor for the past 12 months. It's the next stage of the Assassination Witness Project from the GI. Right, okay. Well, look, let's start with Anna then. Could you tell us about the Assassination Witness Project? Sure. The Assassination Witness Project and its campaign were both officially launched in June 2020 with the release of the book Faces of Assassination, Bearing Witness to the Victims of Organized Crime. The aim of this project is to draw public attention to the fact that across the globe, assassinations are being used as a tool by organized criminal groups. And many of those who stand up for truth, transparency and public integrity face grave threats of violence. So this project is centered in four main pillars. Through advocacy, we aim to keep assassinations in the public consciousness. And by research, we aim to provide better evidence based that can contribute to responses and solutions to assassinations. We also aim to facilitate dialogues, for example, through our podcast series. And we also aim to contribute to strengthening community resilience through the Resilience Fund. And this Four main pillars are currently concentrated in two main actions. Firstly, we have the campaign and the faces of assassination, by which we remember stories of individuals, journalists, environmentalists, victims of assassinations, and through the Global Assassination Monitor, which is our data-driven work stream. Anina has been the driving force behind the data analysis at the GI and has been involved in a number of big projects like the Organized Crime Index and the IUU Phishing Index. Now she's turned her expertise to this 
new database that records contract killings around the world, the Global Assassination Monitor. The database includes assassinations and attempted assassinations. And at the moment, it covers more than 2,700 cases spread across more than 80 countries. Um, the data at the moment covers only 2019 and 2020, but it aims to be updated on an annual basis. It is geographically disaggregated information and includes a number of variables such as name and background of perpetrators and victims, the exact location as reported, and the date of the attack, motives, weapons, and prices paid. The global monitor is made of two levels. So one level is the actual global database, which draws on global and regional news sources. Then we have a second layer um, where we included national sources for a selected 10 countries only. So what makes this database different from other monitors out there? Well, other monitors usually focus on a specific target group, such as journalists or environmental defenders. Whereas the Global Assassinations Monitor is the first database on contract killings and looks more at the role of organized crime in those killings. So it doesn't focus solely on one target group. It allows for broader comparison across countries and an ability to monitor shifts and trends in those killings. And so from, from this, you know, gathering all of this data of all these different assassinations, what, what has the data that you've gathered, what's it telling us about assassinations around the world? So what we found is assassinations took place in every continent around the world, yet they did cluster geographically. So they were higher in some continents than others. So for example, in the Americas um, and in Asia. Um, but even within continents, there were stark variations. So they, for example, Colombia and Mexico had a very high number of cases where other countries within the Americas didn't. And um, we also found that assassinations cluster around certain target groups. We found that what we defined as local community, which includes activists, community leaders, for example, and members of indigenous groups, were the main target group. We also found that it clusters around certain motive, mainly political motives. And um, so there we looked at what drives assassinations. And that included, for example, the killing of political opponents, political dissidents, as well as activists or journalists, as long as they were targeted for political reasons. Then we found that the main method that was being used were firearms. That was the case globally as well as in every single continent. And we also looked at the perpetrator category, which is a bit problematic because there was a very high proportion of, of cases where the perpetrators were not reported. But in cases where perpetrators were reported, we found that in the majority of cases, armed groups and organized crime groups were behind or involved in these killings. So you mentioned there the difficulty in, in, in you know, finding information about the perpetrators and things like that. So given that difficulty, how was this data gathered? Yeah, the data is, draws on newspaper reports. That is, it draws on global newspapers as well as regional newspapers. And for the selected 10 countries, it also draws on national newspapers. We went through, well, it's a kind of a database, LexisNexis, where we searched the newspapers for relevant articles, we then coded or research assistants coded the articles and put them in Excel. And each and every case went then through various rounds of quality control to see that the information that was gathered and inputted was correct. So a lot of painstaking research and data inputting has gone into this. But it's not the only thing. Alongside the database, Anna Paula and Nina have also written a paper called Killing in Silence based on the data from the Global Assassinations Monitor. And it reveals a lot, and we'll get to some of it during this podcast, but it's totally worth a read, so check out the link in the podcast notes. One of the aspects that the data revealed was the transnational nature of contract killings. For example, there is a story of an Israeli crime boss called Ben Suthi, a man with a long criminal past, including a conviction for attempted murder during the gang wars of the 1990s. He was also suspected of involvement in drug trafficking and violent crimes in Central America. He'd made a lot of enemies over the years. And in July 2019, he was gunned down in a restaurant in Mexico City by a hit woman who it was suspected was hired to kill Suthi by the Jalisco New Generation cartel on behalf of an Israeli organized crime group. 
The perpetrator revealed that she was paid just 260 US dollars to carry out the murder. A truly international assassination. A notorious Israeli underworld figure is assassinated in Mexico by a local woman who was hired by a Mexican cartel on behalf of a rival Israeli organized crime group. I think that what the data shows when we had information on the perpetrator is that the potential that criminal groups can organize contract killings that transbound national borders. The data allows us to see this kind of trends. But the transnational side can also be in terms of the illicit markets that enable or drivers to assassinations. So, for example, somebody that is reporting on the international illicit trafficking drugs and that's for because of that reporting, that person got killed. So the transnational element can play in different parts of the assassinations. So what role does organized crime play in assassinations all over the world? I think that's a very interesting question, and, and I think that's one that we are trying to highlight with this research. Assassinations or contract killings, because we are using the same definition in our research, are mechanism used strategically by criminal groups to achieve that political, economic, and criminal interest. And from our research, we found that they are very often intertwined with the works of organized crime. So organized criminal groups would order an assassination to protect their turf, the illicit supply chains, or they would be involved in assassinations because they are providing a pool of hitmen that can then be used against, for example, civil society members, which is, is, is the aim group that we want to look at with this campaign. So as perpetrators, we can see that organized criminal groups can be directly involved in contract killings. For example, when a gang boss order a lower rank gang member to kill a journalist that is reporting on drug trafficking in Mexico, for example. But organized criminal groups can also be directly involved in the second case by providing the source, the assassin, the gunman to those who are willing to pay a price to get someone killed. And this could be, for example, a politician that wants to kill the rival or, for example, a former husband that is in grief because his partner is with somebody else and wants to have this person killed. In the, in the personal cases that we've been tracking. So you can see that in the second role, organized criminal groups are completely interacting with the legal economy, let's say. So it's an interaction between the underworld and the upper world. And how important is it for organized crime to have this capacity for extreme violence that we see with assassinations? I think organized crime uses its capacity for violence to protect territory. So in the case where we see that organized crime is using assassinations to protect the turf, the least supply chains, and this could be resulting in assassinations of members of the same or opposite criminal groups. And we track these cases because by tracking these cases, we can understand this capacity for violence. But increasingly, we've seen that organized crime also uses this potential for violence against the members of civil society groups and against the police, against the legal fraternity. And then this capacity for violence is not only used, I suppose, to gain territorial control, but to finance its illegal activities as well. And also a way of infiltrating and democratic institutions in the economy and gain control and power over communities. So I think on the criminal perspective, let's say, organized crime uses assassinations in the capacity for violence to protect the territory and gain territorial control, but also to infiltrate in the legal economy. When we look at these contract killings, you often hear numbers. And of course, when we discuss a database, that is obviously a key component. But within the monitor, you can also find out the motive behind the killing. Of course, not all motives can be ascertained. It's not like you can walk up to the murderer and say, why did you assassinate this person? So let's go back to Nina to explain. Yeah, motives is a very uh, tricky thing to record, I think, um, since motives can overlap and it's not always clear cut which motive was behind it. We followed newspaper reports, so we took what was reported in the newspapers and we chose the primary motive as reported. That doesn't always mean that, for example, if a politician is killed, it doesn't automatically mean that a political motive was behind it. So if a politician was killed, then it could potentially be that the, the wife of the politician was behind it because the politician was involved in a love triangle or that the economic motive might be behind it because a politician was in debt and didn't repay the debt. So 
that is why the motive and the, the victim groups, they don't necessarily overlap. And if you use the Global Assassinations Monitor tool online, the recorded assassinations have been split into four main categories. Economic, personal, political and organised crime. You can look at these specific categories and see how geographically spread they are. For example, let's take India, and reporting on contract killings in India are often more detailed than elsewhere. In 27% of their recorded assassination cases, the primary reason for hiring a contract killer was for personal motives. So here we're looking at love triangles or family disputes. Whereas if we turn to Colombia, the motive behind 45% of assassinations is political. In South Africa, the motive behind 67% of contract killings is linked to organized crime, again driven in large part by the notoriously violent taxi industry. The GI has done loads of research on this, so check out some of the links in the podcast notes. Now, for anyone who has followed the news reports or watched the countless documentaries on the so-called war on drugs in places like Mexico, you'll have seen the open brutality of the killings, bodies dismembered and dumped in the open with crude messages attached. Assassinations like this help to create a climate of fear and actually contribute to criminal governance in a particular region. Anna can take it from here. This is one actually of the key aspects that we are trying to, to look at, the ripple effect of one single assassination. So let me give you one example. If you're a member of a hero community in a very remote area where there's few state presence or few media like, reporting on stuff, the leader of that community who firstly exposed the works of the illegal loggers, he then gets killed. You're likely to remain silent to avoid you being the next so it's a form of criminal governance in the sense that this horrific, violent method is used to impose uh, criminal control and uh, the, is acute the criminal activity and in the end generates a climate of fear and silence in, over the community. And then when you think about the cases where messages were left in the bodies or a violent, sheer violent method was used involving torture, and in this case, the message is even more clear to the community. It's a, it's a overexpression of that control. And I would add one point to that. In many of these cases where we've seen those messages being left, the identification of the victim was rarely possible, which brings about another layer of problems. It makes investigation and prosecution more difficult. It can pretty much overlap with other cases of disappearance, for example. If you cannot identify the victim, you're, you cannot be sure if that was a person that is missing. So one single assassination has the potential to silence an entire community. And the cases that we have picked up are very likely to be just the tip of the iceberg. And we have proved that with some sort of the, our data because the numbers that were recorded in international media in comparison to those countries that we had additional national sources, there is a discrepancy between those. So when we added national sources to 10 selected countries, we got an increase of almost 2,000 cases in the database. So I think the problem is very, very big and, and the culture of fear and the environment of silence is even bigger. One aspect that the Global Monitor categorizes is media. And you know, on a personal level, I've always found it difficult to hear about the targeting of journalists. Perhaps this is because of my own background in journalism and having many friends who are still journalists. But it's also because I believe in journalism, the fundamental idea of holding power to account. There is a quote often attributed to George Orwell that's always struck me. If liberty means anything at all, it means the right to tell people what they do not want to hear. To me, an attack on a journalist is an attack on a fundamental pillar of a democratic society. So when I see journalists like Javier Valdez in Mexico or Peter de Vries in the Netherlands being attacked for seeking the truth, it's always hit me. The Monitor shows that 7% of the recorded assassination cases were in the media category, which is the fifth highest but considerably less than the top category of local community. So why do cases involving the media garner so much attention in comparison to other target groups? I think that's a very interesting question. And I suppose one of the answers would be that media would tend to report on their own, of course. 
But I think that it's more to that. I think that increasingly we have seen that journalists are reported to be killed because of their work. And I think that's key to understand why it's necessary and why it's increasingly of the fact that the assassination of media workers are receiving so much attention. Assassinations of media workers, including journalists, is a clear attack to freedom of speech, and which is one of the most elementary values of any democratic society. So in many of these cases where the driver to the assassination relate to the work of exposing criminal activity, exposing corruption and corrupted networks, that includes in, inclusively um, high-profile figures in democratic society. I think that's why those cases become very high-profile and very sensitive. And that's why we need to keep track of those and keep them in the public consciousness and push for criminal justice. And, and you're saying that, the impact on democratic societies, what effect do assassinations in general, what effect do they have on democratic society? I think one important effect to be highlighted is the breakdown of democratic integrity. And we've seen this very much in the case of journalists that we just touched upon. If the journalist is killed because they're exposing criminal connections between politicians and organized crime, let's say um, they are killed with the intent of, of them getting silenced and there is no information to the public on what's going on. And if there's no information, there's no public opinion, there's no accountability. This is one example, but you can also think about in the context of electoral violence, those assassinations have the potential of reducing the number of capable and willing individuals who may have wanted before to run for offices, but because they would fear getting killed, they don't want to run for office anymore. And as a result, the electoral candidate pool is diminished. So I think those cases highlight the potential that assassinations have on undermining democratic societies. The Global Initiative launched the Monitor in November last year, and as part of that launch, we sat down with a few experts to discuss the findings. One of those we spoke to was Andrew Caruana Galizia, the son of the murdered Maltese journalist, Daphne Caruana Galizia. When a journalist is assassinated, especially a journalist investigating corruption, it's a symptom of something deeply wrong in, in the state. Um, so you cannot leave it to the state to respond. Um, the journalists are often the, only become targets once state agencies have already failed. And, and that's something we knew was the case in, in Malta and, and was the case even in other European countries like Slovakia. That's Andrew Caruana Galizia speaking at our Global Assassination Monitor launch and you can find a link to that video in the podcast notes. Now, an important finding from the study shows that assassinations are geographically clustered. So let's go back to Ana Paula. Although assassinations are a global phenomenon, we found that some locations we had higher concentrations of assassinations, and these can be for different reasons, including differences on the reporting. So in a certain place, media attention might be driven to the assassinations or in somewhere else, no. But there are some commonalities that we can find to trying to identify those hotspots. First, in the presence of criminal markets and illicit flows that contribute to high level of assassinations. For example, in the case of Mexico or El Salvador, the higher number of contract killings is closely linked to the drug trade and extortion. And interestingly, the case of El Salvador, we found way more disinformation when we added the national sources. In Brazil, for example, the dynamic was a little bit different. We had prevalence of cases that were related to the drug trade in the southeast of the country and assassinations in the Amazon based or closely linked to the exploitation of natural resources. So in this context, the existence of certain illicit markets, such as the drugs market, the environmental crimes, are more prone to create violence and in this geographic areas. And that may contribute to higher levels of assassinations in a particular country rather than other illicit markets. But geographic clusters might also appear due to the availability of hitmen. And this was, for example, the case of South Africa. So South Africa taxi industry, it's highly linked to many of assassinations in the country. And the, the cluster of assassinations there is very much related as well to the existence of a pool of hitmen. 
It's interesting you mentioned South Africa there because, of course, we've got people at the GI who've worked extensively looking at the at the guns to gangs scandal that happened down there. And one thing that was clear from the report was the the majority, the vast majority of assassinations were carried out using firearms. So, what does this tell you about the links between illicit firearms and assassinations? I think that's a very interesting question and the link you made to South Africa because the case of South Africa shows this national dynamics that contribute to the availability of firearms and therefore that could be linked to many assassinations. So indeed, although there were some variations in proportion as firearms were the main murder method across the globe in, according to our database, I suppose this tells some things about the, the firearms trade. Or when it comes to the link between firearm-related offences, such as assassinations and homicides, this link is not always clear, not always there. But I think what we can say is that the prevalent use of firearms in some regions can be linked to the widespread availability of firearms across regions, and then the illicit trade would play a role there. For example, in the Americas, which had the highest number of recorded assassinations in our database, it's also the main destination continent for firearms trafficking. So similarly, in conflict zones such as Yemen and Somalia, which both recorded a high number of assassinations, the illicit firearms trade has fueled the conflict and created space for criminal activity. So we've heard that assassinations are clustered together in certain regions of the world. So what about the perpetrators, those that carry out the actual killing? How do they get hired? I mean, we heard in South Africa that the taxi industry is a particular source of contract killers. So, how much does it actually cost to hire a hitman? So we have a number of dynamics that affect the cost. Accessibility and professionalism of the hitman. So basically, how easy are they to find and how good are they? The more professional they are, the higher the cost. Then we have the target themselves. What risks are associated with them? The higher the profile of a target, the greater the risks, the higher the contract price. So when it comes to price, that information is, of course, hard to come by. Anecdotal evidence such as the case of Ben Suthi, it can be as little as 260 US dollars. But the cost can vary massively, even in one specific country. So let's take India as an example. The lowest recorded price was 94 US dollars. 94 US dollars to take a life. Yet the highest in that same country was 68,232 US dollars. But obviously those prices can only be known once a perpetrator is caught. The most professional hitmen and the masterminds behind specific killings are unlikely to be caught. And so that information is simply not known. And so we come to the masterminds, the people who order the killing, the person behind the person with the gun. According to the Global Monitor, in 62% of cases, information about the people behind the murders is unknown. So why are they so difficult to identify, let alone prosecute? I think that's the one. How does it say the one billion dollar question? <laughs> I think the problem starts with the nature of the crime. Contract killings are created to masquerade the person who orders the murder. So they are executed precisely because they make it difficult to investigate and persecute the person who is in the chain of command. This person won't leave physical evidence in the crime scene. They won't have contact or surveil the victim. They are less likely to be seen by eyewitnesses. So investigating and prosecuting a mastermind essentially we're relying on getting evidence that links the hitman or the middleman to that person. And that becomes a very difficult job. And this is for various reasons, not only to the fact that it's difficult to find evidence in the crime scene. The other reason is that search killings are highly sensitive, political sensitive, and there is lack of political will to promptly investigate such incidents, um, systemic problems within agencies that are in charge of conducting investigation and prosecution, such as corruption, connections between high-level officials and organized crime, and so all the sort of things can contribute to high levels of impunity. Another possible reason for that is the professionalism of contract killers, because, you know, if you have to find the hitmen to then 
link to the middleman to then link to the mastermind. If you get an experienced professional hitman, they are very unlikely to leave a trail of evidence and then makes it difficult to prosecute the case. So also limited police resources for that. So if there is lack of police capacity to investigate and lack of resources, special police units working on organized crime issues, all these sort of things can contribute to the failure of many investigations. So there are lots of things going on that enable the masterminds to go largely unpunished. The Global Assassination Monitor is the first of its kind, the first global monitor of contract killings and it's available to look at now. In this episode, we've only touched on the edges of the information that is now available thanks to the work of Nina and Anna Paula. So finally, what comes next for the Global Assassination Monitor? Let's start with Nina. So the way we're releasing it is on one hand, we have the report, and then we're also publishing the data on a website where people can download the raw data as well as look at graphics and analyze the data visually online. By doing so, we are hoping to draw more attention to the issue of contract killings or, and the role organized crime plays in those. We'll be publishing individual analysis pieces and blog posts throughout the year. And then on an annual basis, we are hoping to release new data, global data, as well as the case study data for the individual countries. And Anna, you... What do you hope to get out of, of this monitor? What do you hope that people will take away from this? I really hope that people see the role that organized crime is taking in those assassinations and then how this capacity for violence is then transferred to, against civil society. And also, I think, the scale of the problem and how many cases are underreported and we don't have a follow-up and how many people are basically, as we say in the report, being killed in silence. I think that's what we want to highlight with this project. Well, Anna Paula, Nina, thank you very much for coming on the podcast and I'm sure we'll speak again soon, so thank you. Thank you very much thank for you. having us. You can access the Global Assassination Monitor by heading over to the Assassination Witness website assassination.globalinitiative.net. There you can also access a free PDF copy of the Faces of Assassination book. You can also find the podcast series Faces of Assassination wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also see in the summary to this show that you can find a link to the paper Killing in Silence written by Nina and Anna Paula, as well as any related papers and research from the Global Initiative and a link to the launch video and Killing in Silence documentary. Over the coming years, the GI will continue to upkeep, monitor, research and expand the database. We'll also be launching a new podcast series based on the research that results from that data. For more research from the GI, again, head over to the website globalinitiative.net. There you can also find our other podcasts and videos about organized crime around the world. Please remember to subscribe, rate and share this podcast around. The Global Initiative is all over social media, so remember to tag us in any of your posts. Again, thank you to Nina Kaiser and Ana Paula Oliveira from here at the GI for their work and taking the time to talk to us about it. That's it for this episode of Deep Dive, exploring organized crime from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. I'm Jack Megan Vickers. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.